Okay. So, hello and um, welcome to this special session on fish friendly irrigation, enhancing production, livelihoods, and health, which has been organized by World Fish in collaboration with the International Water Management Institute and partners, including especially FAO and OCID. Um, my name is Matthew McCartney. I'm the research group leader for the Water Infrastructure and Ecosystems Research Group at the International Water Management Institute, and I will be moderating this event. I see we've got about 25 people so far, um, hopefully joining us from different places around the world. We have just, we've got just 90 minutes for this session. Um, so while we wait for hopefully a few more people to join, allow me to quickly direct your attention to some housebreak housekeeping rules that are showing on your screens now. Please take a few moments to read these through. Please also note the following instructions. Um, the event is being split into two main sessions. The first will be around research presentations and the second will be breakout rooms where we hope to have some discussion. Um, it's important that you engage with us through the Zoom app and not on your browser in order to be able to engage in the breakout, the breakout session. Um, Zoom, Zoom's chat box has been dis disabled by the organizing committee. So please direct all your comments and questions into the passable chat box. If possible, go to a split screen mode, mode so that you can see both the Zoom and the passable chat. Attendees cameras and microphones are currently switched off. Um, but you'll be able to use them when we, when we go into the breakout room sessions. Finally, please, if you could please type your name, uh, your work title and your organization's name into the Pathful chat box. That will give us a record of who joined this meeting. Thanks a lot. Now, without further ado, I'd like to start with a substantive part of this discussion and I invite Rachel McDonnell, Deputy Director General, for research for development at the International Water Management Institute to present her opening remarks. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, uh, Matthew, for starting us off so well and for everyone joining this event that is jointly convened by World Fish and EMI, two centers of this one CGIR. And it's great to have everybody with us this morning. I'm sure many of you remember a best-selling book and subsequent film that came out about a decade ago called We Need to Talk About Kevin. It was about the challenges the parents of a sociopathic teenager had to deal with and their avoidance of having difficult conversations about their son. I feel that here at World Water Week that the often difficult and avoided subject is how to balance agriculture and food security along water secure, alongside water security. This year, there are only 22 sessions out of many hundreds with agriculture or food security as a key word. Yet given that agriculture uses 75% of the world's water, it is important that water and food security are spoken about together and solutions co-developed. So maybe we need to talk about food systems here at World Water Week. This is why this session on fish-friendly irrigation systems is important to developing conversations in this space. What we do know is that for thousands of years, irrigation has been extremely important for food security, livelihoods and social economic development, and for supporting the rise and fall of civilizations. Now more so than ever, many governments around the world are investing in irrigation as a form of climate change adaptation. Thus the global context in which irrigation, invest in, in, ir, irrigation investment is occurring is changing fast. The need for healthier and more sustainable food systems is placing new demands on how irrigation is developed and managed. And we need to bring this into the discussions here at Stockholm, as well as in many arenas, as well as in the many arenas we work in. As we will hear many time, times during this Stockholm Water Week, we know there is a growing water scarcity and pressure from competing water uses. And if we also include the need to protect biodiversity and ecosystems, this means irrigation is and will increasingly be called on to perform better. Not only delivering acceptable returns on investment and improving food security, but also enhancing nutrition and supporting environmental conservation. We have a very tall order to, to realize. As we will learn in this session, 
New thinking where we can better integrate fisheries and irrigation can contribute to the achievement of these multiple objectives that um, irrigation is now called on to deliver. Realizing benefits from irrigation and fisheries integration for poor and marginalized households requires that technical infrastructure design be combined with social engagement and local institution building. Today, we have three exciting presentations. The first highlights the importance of fisheries and food systems development. The second presents some examples of fisheries and irrigation systems in Southeast Asia. And the third presents an overview of guidelines developed by World Fish, EMI and FAO to integrate fisheries and irrigation. These three presentations will then be followed by discussions on the opportunities and constraints for integrating fisheries and integrate in irrigation. And in those breakout sessions, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on how fisheries and irrigation can be better managed together. So we're looking forward to these conversations and discussions, and I'm sure we're all going to come away thinking more about how water, agriculture and food systems can be better brought together. Thank you, Matthew, and back to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Those are excellent opening remarks. I think it puts very nicely the context in, in which we have this discussion today. We're now going to start the research presentations, which are led by experts on um, fish friendly irrigation systems. And they will discuss how these integrated systems can enhance global food systems production, equitable livelihoods, and the health of people and planet. Please remember to type any questions you have into the passable chat as we'll have a few minutes after the three presentations are finished to ask questions. Now I call upon our first presenter, Simon Fungay smith who is a senior fisheries officer at FAO, to make his presentation. Over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, colleagues. Um, can I just check that you can see my, my full screen there? Yeah, yes, Simon. Well, yeah, let me if you just... put it in the, you think you've got it split, if you could just try and, yeah, get rid of the, that's right, possible. that's great, now it's fine, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much to uh, World Fish and IMI for arranging this event um, in Water Week and also for giving FAO the opportunity to present on why inland fisheries are an important uh, for development and why they should not be overlooked. Inland fisheries are found in rivers, streams, deltas, floodplains, flooded forests, any kind of uh, natural water body um, or man-made water bodies around the world. And particularly, they're very important in uh, the tropics. Inland fisheries are mostly small scale and diffuse, uh, pursued by individuals, families, um, and they use a huge range of traditional gears and techniques to access fish for food. At the end of monsoon season, fisheries are very important in inland waters, targeting choke points in irrigation, drawdowns on floodplains, and particularly around uh, uh, structures uh, that, that manage water and control water in irrigation systems. Rice field fisheries are also extremely important sources of food. They generate a huge range of biodiversity, up to 230 species of aquatic animals are exploited in rice fields throughout Southeast Asia and South Asia particularly, but also into other regions as well. Global inland fisheries catch in 2021 was 12.1 million tonnes. That's 13% of the total catch of global food of fish, but importantly, it's 21% of the global fish that's directly used for food. So it is an important contribution, a fifth of the world's fish supply from capture fisheries. That fish, 12.1 million, 12 .1 million tonnes, is equivalent to full dietary animal protein of about 164 million people. That's 2% of the global population. And importantly, it's mostly in low GDP countries and it provides a very, very important supplement to both nutrition, micronutrients, vitamins. You'd also be surprised at the level of engagement in inland fisheries. Around 17 to 21 million people engage in inland capture fisheries and up to 40 million people in post-harvest. That's two and a half to 6% of the global agricultural workforce. And importantly, these are often part-time livelihoods mixed in with other forms of rural uh, livelihood strategies, particularly agriculture. Regulating water has a wide range of impacts on aquatic ecosystems and their biodiversity, and particularly on fish, which are used for food security. Some of those impacts are positive, 
extension of aquatic regimes, but mostly those impacts are negative. And this is what we'll focus on a little bit today. The irrigation systems of the world were mainly designed to optimize and, and make efficient water delivery for crop production. Fish were rarely factored into the system. And those considerations have meant that we've got gains in crops from irrigation, but we've had to uh, offsets from losses of fisheries. Principally, the reason is because of that disruption of connectivity of water. It blocks fish movement in the wet seasons, particularly as fish move both up and down through water systems and through irrigation uh, uh, command areas. The alteration of flows also causes problems with fish. It upsets behavioral cues, results in early migrations, disrupts um, and, and damages fish as they move through regulators and due to the turbulent flow and particularly turbines on dams. On the positive side, the creation of new habitats and extension of wetlands through uh, damming and reservoir construction means that there are new environments that can be exploited and even wetlands in seepage areas and drainages. So overall, irrigation systems and their reservoirs are kind of complex dynamic ecosystems, but with the right type of management, fish production can be increased or restored. The greening of grey infrastructure and nature-based solutions are the way to do this, and they offer options to restore fisheries, particularly when we're designing, upgrading, or renovating uh, irrigation systems. Greening grey infrastructure through fish passages, we'll hear about that today, and tailoring low-head uh, fishways or, or improving regulators to allow downstream movement of larval fish without getting damaged is also another strategy. We can promote nature-based solutions, constructed wetlands, community fish refuges, rice fish integration, restoration of riparian habitat and flood control systems can all be leveraged for fish production and inland fisheries and are in Southeast Asia and South Asia already. We can enhance fisheries in reservoirs and irrigation tanks, mainly through stock enhancement and culture-based fisheries, uh, promoting their natural productivity and trying to restore or even create uh, fisheries, uh, uh, new fisheries there. So in terms of recommendations, what we're looking for is proactive policy for integration of fish into irrigation schemes to highlight its potential to enhance aquatic biodiversity and livelihoods, particularly its role in nutrition, and to build technical capacity to support integration of fish into irrigation improvements. And importantly, we want to see that lending portfolios for irrigation do incorporate fisheries integration to try and capture these opportunities of fish as a food system. With that, thank you very much. And I'd like to now to hand you over to Kun Chaiwa, who is going to uh, provide uh, a presentation on uh, fish-friendly irrigation systems in Thailand, a case study on Bang Rakam lowland model. Kun Chaiwa is the Vice President at the International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, ICID. Over to you, Kun Chaiwa. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Let me share my screen first. Yep. Okay. As a representative of ICID, I would like to say that integrating of fish farming with uh, irrigation is something that ICID is interested in. We can find articles in ICID's Irrigation and Drainage Journal discussing about this subject. This slide shows such an article on the benefit of using drainage water of fish farm for irrigation. It was co-authored by ICID's present president, Dr. Rakap Rakap, received Best Paper Award in 2017. As Thailand is a country with some example of fish farming closely related to irrigation system, I would like to present some aspects of this topic from Thailand. In Thailand, many activities of fish farming in relation to irrigation are present. In many large, medium, and small storage resources, fish species were released every year, and catching fish and fishery products give good income to people living near this resource. Fish farming, fish cake, or in floating baskets are done in resource. Some environmental problems are observed. 
and some controls need to be enforced. These are some fish cakes in the rivers. Even in the river, they sometimes need uh, the storage water from the irrigation storage reservoir during a low flow, they need additional water. This in the farmer's pond, fish ponds also need reliable supply of water. So area with dependable water supply such as in irrigated area are preferred. Some farmers do fish farming in rice field which can benefit rice growing also by increasing rice yield, while selling fish give additional income to the farmer. Recently, the Royal Irrigation Department of Thailand developed a lowland area of, uh, in the beginning of 42,000 hectare, now it's about 60,000 hectare at Bangrakam in the lower northern region. It's between two last rivers, you can see, the Levant, the Yom River with our storage reservoir and the right one, the green, the blue one is a one with storage reservoir. And it's this lowland area inside here that is flooded almost every year. And so the, the government tried to uh, alleviate this problem. So they want to do this project. You can see that uh, also rice harvesting had to be done by board and it's a, uh, always where the rice damage. By constructing some uh, water control structures and changing of crop schedule to early planting and harvesting, it's possible to let the flood surcharge into the area after rice harvesting and use the area as flood retarding basin. During this period of flood storage, fish culture can be made successfully besides dry season rice crop can add another benefit to the farmer. You can see that uh, in the slide uh, here, usually farmer will plant uh, rice middle of May to June, but now we shift it to 1st of April, and then we can harvest it earlier, end of July. Then from 1st of August to end of November, four months we can store flood, something like 400 million cubic meter to 500 million cubic meter in a dry season, another dry season crop. By doing this, we have to uh, use also a lot of water from the reservoir. Changing of tradition pattern of water control to arrive at this new scheme takes a lot of participation from local authorities, government agencies, and from the farmers themselves. However, with a lot of meetings and consultation, the project has become a successful one with more benefit to the people. We need to modify some control structure for the dry season crop of rice. And every year the government agencies and farmers release a lot of fish species mm -hmm. into this area. Now you can see the success of the project. Is this picture coming two months ago? This year, this year the rainy season crop it looks so beautiful, and we'll get a full benefit from this one. This is a sample of a fish catch from the reservoir. You see the large uh, giant catfish. Actually, it's in from the Mekong River, but from artificial insemination, the, our fishery department breed it and then uh, release in the, some reservoir, and this is how we catch it. And my last slide show you the famous fishery products from Barakam project area. And so this, after the successful implementation of this project, the government plan to extend the concept to other lowland area also. Thank you very much for your attention. And now allow me to introduce the next presenter, Sophie Nyan Kiao, Senior Advisor of Water Security at Helvetus Swiss intercooperation to the virtual flow. Sophie, please. Yeah, thank you, Chai Wat, and hello everyone. Uh, I hope you see my presentation now. 
So, uh, as well illustrated by the previous speakers, integrating uh, fisheries in irrigation requires a shift in thinking, viewing irrigation as agroecosystems that have multiple functions and deliver a range of services far beyond uh, crop production. Are you hearing me? Because I can't see, yeah. I think you don't so have the video, you're... right? Yes, Sophie, sir. you're fine. We okay. can hear you. Okay. Just can you put it in can you put it in presentation mode? That's fine. But otherwise it's good. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So um we, we also need to extend the scope of the boundary of the conventional system and to engage with a wider range of stakeholders, uh, as well as understanding the distribution of uh, cost and benefits. I have some issues with the... Okay. Meaning who is gaining or losing what, where in the system, how and how much. Noting that, as uh, earlier mentioned, fish friendly irrigation provides a range of nature-based solutions. For implementation, we propose a step process that is participatory, integrated and adaptive, uh, conducting steps, some steps uh, in an iterative or recursive manner if needed, and the stakeholders will remain engaged with the interdisciplinary team throughout the process and uh, we propose select, uh, selected tools and methods of uh, different degrees of complexity to uh, support implementation of each of the six steps. So first, understanding the context, the irrigation system, uh, its key features and uh, making a distinction between a new scheme, the rehabilitation or modernization. Uh, we also need to understand all attributes of the context in which irrigation is brought, uh, covering the biophysical, ecological, socioeconomic and livelihood aspects, as well as the governance context. Focusing on local institutional arrangements, the national legislation of the relevant sectors, and the coordination or lack of coordination between institutions, local partnerships and co-management that may already exist um, in the system. At the same time, uh, there's a need to engage with stakeholders uh, through some preparation uh, to identify, map and analyze the stakeholders and to be ready to address potential or existing conflicts. So the next step is to assess the main impacts and opportunities, starting with a risk assessment to prioritize uh, the main uh, changes brought by irrigation, and then going through a more comprehensive assessment of the priority consequences on the biophysical environment, on fisheries production and livelihoods, and on the governance of uh, water fisheries and the environment. So uh, next, the potential measures will be uh, screened and scoped to mitigate uh, the impacts of irrigation on, uh, by maintaining aquatic habitats, uh, as well as the connectivity between these. Uh, there are uh, other uh, measures that are not mentioned here, but these are the main ones. Um, it's not just about mitigation, it's also about enhancing or improving fisheries and fisheries production in the existing or newly created habitats and developing the supply chain. So uh, maximizing the benefits of both agriculture and fisheries uh, at the same time in the same system will very likely lead to a range of uh, trade-offs and difficult decisions to uh, make for irrigation planning and management. That is why identifying the water requirements for both sectors uh, in terms of uh, the timing, the frequency, the quantity and quality is uh, very important. A trade-off analysis and multi-criteria assessment will help select the best options by the key actors that will then commit to implementation of these measures. 
and then the whole journey will um, be monitored and adapted. Finally, uh, some uh, remarks to conclude. Uh, irrigation is increasingly expected to deliver multiple benefits, not only for food production and return on investment, but also for food and nutrition security, social inclusion and improved rural livelihoods, and the integrity of the landscape and the preservation of the environment. So we hope that this session will uh, help increase awareness on the urgent need to plan design, build, operate, and manage irrigation as multiple use system, using tools and guidelines, such as for fisheries, uh, this guide published uh, and introduced by Rachel and published by FAO, EMI, and the World Fish last year. Uh, this guide is uh, meant to be further developed and improved through lessons from implementation, hopefully, from an uh, increasing number of water professionals. Thank you. I no, now pass back uh, the virtual floor to uh, Matthew McCartney, our moderator for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, just a, a few questions for the presenters. Thanks to all presenters for their, their very clear presentations. I think they provided good examples of, but firstly, the importance of integrating fisheries into irrigation schemes um, and then some guidance at the end on these on, on, on how to go about it. So very quickly, um, first of all for Simon, um, aquaculture is, is growing rapidly worldwide and in, in fact in many countries uh, aquaculture now produces more fish than um, captured fisheries. Can you just briefly, very briefly, say what are the issues with simply replacing captured fisheries with aquaculture? Thanks. It's really a question of uh, regions and locations. There, there are options in some places to do this, but uh, really where aquaculture thrives, it's usually because fisheries is not, does not have such a great potential. Uh, I think one of the most important things to realize is that fresh waters still produce the majority of aquaculture products. And so to have sustainable intensification of aquaculture uh, is something that is, is a goal that we're looking for. And that means we have to deal with water use, we have to deal with the environment, environmental footprint and also the downstream effluence and this kind of thing. So there's a lot of opportunity to have far better integration of aquaculture into water management and water systems around the world, particularly in Asia, but also in some of the other regions such as Sub-Saharan Africa. Great, thanks very much. Um, and try what? You, you gave a very good example, the, the, the Bang Rakam model. Um, showing very clearly that it was very successful. Um, but I wonder, and you mentioned that the government wanted to replicate it elsewhere in Thailand. I just wonder whether it has been replicated anywhere. Um, and, and perhaps very briefly give us some of, some of the constraints to replication of that sort of model. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I, as I told you that uh, the government tried to uh, doing something like this, use this concept in the lower Javia region. And they, are, they were looking for in a larger area, in many, in about 12 places. And I think uh, the constraints will be first of all, uh, charted of water in the beginning of the season. And in this area, this is close to, to Bangkok, they are more urban and Maybe uh, area is not so confined like in Barakam area. Maybe may a little bit difficult to control. And also farmers in the lower area, they are accustomed to uh, growing rice all year round. So maybe some difficulty in trying to, uh, to put them in a, a, a certain schedule like, like we're doing in, in Barakam. I, I think that's the problem that I can think of. Thank you. So it's, it's also increasing awareness with farmers, perhaps, of some of the benefits that come from integrating fisheries into the yes. system. Yeah. Okay. Thank the you. Certain area is okay. In you mean in these twelve uh, new area, some area will be better suited to this concept. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So we have to identify where it will work and where it won't. But yeah. Thank you very much. And, and finally, for Sophie, um, 
the, the guidelines that you reported on or presented at the end there were intended primarily for irrigation engineers and water planners. Um, what do you think would encourage greater use of the guidelines? Um, I think a range of factors, uh, mainly changing the mindset and framing of irrigation development, further demonstrating uh, that fish friendly irrigation contributes to greening irrigation and uh, showing that it provides many more nature based solutions compared to conventional irrigation. Also providing uh, increasing evidence on the key contribution of fish friendly uh, irrigation to several SDGs together. I mean, zero hunger, no poverty, good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, for example. Uh, and it's to enhancing the resilience of rural livelihoods and aquatic ecosystems as well. It's also about better linking um, existing integrated frameworks used in water science, like uh, IWRM, uh, Water Stewardship, with uh, ecosystem-based approaches, landscape approach, economic valuation and uh, governance models across sectors and scales. Uh, lastly, if I may, I think uh, a better contribution of uh, the private sector through uh, frameworks like uh, water stewardship could be uh, very uh, relevant in that case. Right, thanks. I mean, I see that it, 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 you mentioned uh, nature-based solutions, and I see it very much as a nature-based solution, which, as you've said, nature-based solutions now are very topical. Um, so to me, it, it is a nature-based solution, and, and we should be promoting, I think, that aspect of it and, and making clear that it does bring a lot of these other benefits that you mentioned. So not, increasing, not only increasing water productivity uh, on, in itself, but also bringing... Um, many other benefits to, to people, livelihoods, etc. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Sophie. That's uh, very, very good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll now move on to the, the breakout sessions. Um, we, will, we will have three uh, breakout groups focus, focusing on three different themes. Um, the first is actually related to the key barriers to integrating fisheries and irrigation. So what um, are the barriers that prevent more integration of fisheries? Uh, the second breakout group will look at incentives and key levers to improve integration of fisheries in irrigation. So again, what can be done to try and enhance it? And, and the third group will be looking at the enabling environment and how can that enabling environment, environment be improved um, to enhance integration of fisheries in irrigation. So for this, this particular, for the breakout rooms, all participants will be um, randomly sorted into different groups um, and you'll be led through the, through the discussion by three uh, group, breakout group leaders. First of all, Marc Dubois, who is the research lead on fish in multifunctional landscapes at World Fish. Um, secondly, Sanjeev De Silva, who's a senior regional researcher of natural resources government governance, sorry, at the International Water Management Institute, and now leads a lot of our work in, in Myanmar. And Priyani Amara Singh, who's a senior researcher at the International Water Management Institute and has many years of um, experience looking at ecosystems and in particular wetlands and livelihoods. So our communications team will now uh, open the, the rooms and in a few short moments, you'll be automatically transported into the rooms. And then we will all reconvene and you'll automatically be transported back after uh, 25 minutes. Um, so please enjoy the discussion and we hope that, that we have a fruitful time. Thank you very much. Is everybody back? Yes, everyone should be back now. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everybody. And um, thanks to the uh, people, the breakout group leaders. Um, and welcome back to this main session. So we hope you had a, an interesting and engaging discussion, uh, although we realised the time was very, um, very limited. Before I invite the breakout leads to present um, very quickly on their the takeaways they got from the breakout discussions, um, please can I ask you just to type into the uh, the pathable chat, 
uh, your name and which breakout room you were in, just so that we've got a record, because um, unfortunately there's no way of keeping a, a record otherwise. We just need to know um, who was in which room. And then if you have any comments on what, you're, what we're about to discuss now, uh, please add them to the portable chat, uh, and then we can hopefully um, bring that into the discussion. I now want to hand the floor to uh, Mark, Sanjeev and Priyani, just to very briefly go through uh, the main takeaways that they got from the discussions that you've just had. So first of all, over to you, Mark. Mark, you're muted. Very good, thank you very much, Mike. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I'd just quickly like to go through um, breakout group session one. So I'll share my screen. It's actually quite tricky to get a Mentimeter to remain in um, presentation view. So I just wanna ask you if you can all see my screen at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is the largest it goes, I'm afraid, in this, in this mode. So uh, I'd just like to say that um, we focused the discussion around two key questions, the key barriers and constraints to the integration of fisheries and irrigation. And the second question, which was around why fisheries are too frequently um, ignored in planning and manage, managing irrigation schemes. So we had, we had quite a lot, if, if you can have a look at this word cloud, we had quite a lot of uh, uh, entries around um, a lack of awareness and um, capacity and knowledge. Um, we had quite um, a detailed discussion around um, the economics of integrating uh, fisheries in irrigation. Um, one of the issues here really is to be able to understand um, what the current status of fisheries is and what perhaps the implications, both the impacts of irrigation um, negatively on fisheries and the value of integrating fisheries in irrigation infrastructure. So, you know, what are we, what are we going to, how are we going to benefit and is it worth it? And the fact that this might not actually be the case in all in all contexts. So that was that was one of the, one of the issues. And another around the economics was also that um, the uh, systems themselves it costs money to to change the design, um, and anything that incurs costs um, needs to be well understood. And there's a sort of perhaps a reticence and uh, uh, kind of vested interests in, in, remain, in retaining the status quo. So that was, um, I'm conscious that we only have two or three minutes to report back here. So um, I will move on uh, to the next question, but um, I think one other thing that came up here um, was looking at, um, the, the attitudes and the and the thinking, and this was something that Sophie in her presentation mentioned. You know, the the need for a shift in thinking and perceptions. So I'll just quickly talk about the fisheries and why that's often overlooked. Um, in order to do this, we frame the discussion around four statements. You can read these here, but essentially, it was looking at whether the value and benefits of fisheries are um, poorly understood the impacts of irrigation um, being not so well evidenced and capacities and cross-sector relationships are um, fledgling to say the least and a lack of interest or resistance. This, this last one seemed to be um, least um, important in, in the reasons for why fisheries are too frequently overlooked. Two important issues here were that the, the values and benefits of fisheries themselves are poorly understood. I touched on that already. But the, the impacts of irrigation on fisheries are not well evidenced. Now, um, there was um, some qualification of this statement around the fact that um, perhaps it depends on which sector. 
So for the fishery sector, perhaps the impacts of irrigations are well known. Whereas for the irrigation sector, um, perhaps there is a, a lot more work that can be done to, to um, communicate these impacts. So there is, there's, there's, a, there's a nuance there. And finally, um, the, the sort of the cross sector relationships and the, the difficulties perhaps of working across sectors. And one of the, one of the reasons uh, given for this in, in the discussion was that um, we're coming from quite different perspectives, quite different backgrounds, quite different academic training and disciplines. And, um, you know, th this is quite a limiting factor and um, important in understanding why um, fisheries are often overlooked. So I will stop there and uh, just again to thank the uh, group members for breakout session one. It was, a, it was an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Sanjiv to seal that now. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark and Sanjeev. Please go ahead. Yeah. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Can you now see my... Yeah, it's there. Thanks. Yeah. So the what, so here we were really uh, discussing two questions. Um, the first being, you know, how do we convince planners and irrigation irrigation engineers, right, to basically buy into this this idea? And you will see from the from from the word cloud that one thing is, you know, how, you know getting them into the idea of existing thinking to really bring ecosystem thinking to the fore in terms in, in the discourses that uh, that exist within water management and irrigation subsectors. Um, the, the, the second would be to really show and highlight the economic benefits and, and perhaps something linked to that is the, the idea that we perhaps do not link economic benefits with the idea of multiple benefits. Um, you know, maybe there's more work that needs to be done to convert our recognition of multiple benefits into economic benefits as well, so that um, uh, engineers and planners can actually see uh, the much higher rate of uh, rate, rate, rate of return on investment if we can actually do that. And 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 linked to that was the idea that um, seeing is really believing. So if we can actually take examples where this has been done, and indeed. We, we saw an, such an example presented from, from Thailand in this session. And to really unpack those, to really start showing how that can be done, uh, how engineering can actually make that happen, that it does not have to necessarily uh, be business as usual, then that could be a very powerful tool to get you know, greater dialogue with these very critical actors. Uh, I'm gonna then move to to question number two, um, if I can, if I can manage that, right. So here too, you would see, and and Sophie, uh, who was my co-facilitator, rightly pointed out that ecosystem thinking comes up here um, again as as being quite dominant, and so we sort of followed the same the same discussion, if you like. Um, and one of the, the new points that really came in here was the, the point that we also do need to be aware of, as much as we want to convince people, we also do want to be aware of potential um, negative uh, feedback loops as well. So the example that was used was, of course, the, the potential to actually create down, downstream pollution. The other point that came up was, of course, saying, okay, so how do we, how do we then really do this on the ground? And, and the, the key new element that, that came to mind, which comes to my mind, uh, that came out of this discussion was the importance of multi-skilled multi teams, um, not just involving the planners, but agronomists, but, but, but also the farmers. Um, in terms of, you know, how do we conceptualize a, an irrigation scheme? And to bring it to make sure that we have, you know, all those players in the conversation right from the start. Um, 
I am going to stop here. I'm going to, uh, thank you very much for everybody who participated, uh, to Sophie uh, uh, and Julie's support as well, and to ask uh, others who were in, in, the, in this group to please speak up if I've missed anything critical. Thank you. And Yeah, now we'll move, I think, thanks very much, uh, Sanjeev. We're now gonna move over to Priyani and let her give her presentation. And then we can hopefully there'll be a couple of minutes just to have a bit more discussion. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Priyani. Matthew. Yes, so this is the third question we are trying to answer. Uh, how can the enabling environment be improved to enhance integration? Uh, we had two questions on this. How can Governance models encourage stakeholder engagement that are more diverse and sensitive when implementing and managing irrigation practices. Now, most of the time, I think the irrigation departments don't communicate uh, with a large number of uh, stakeholders, and therefore the needs are not understood. And this is the conversation we had. I, I'm sorry, we lost a little time because I couldn't share my presentation and Anis had to do it. Thank you, Anis, for doing that. Now here we saw that this kind of conversation is very important in, in a landscape because governance sort of, you know, uh, mixes into different kinds of sectors. And if the irrigation practices are to be, um, to be in, enforced or managed, uh, we need to speak to so many uh, different groups. So here we see uh, a number of uh, responses that we got from the participants uh, where we felt that uh, situation analysis is important. Uh, there should be some degree of co-management uh, models where irrigation uh, uh, engineers are looking or uh, talking with uh, fish farmers, understanding their issues, uh, especially you know, related to this uh, particular session. Uh, we, we have to have evidence-based information. Uh, there has to be a sensitization. Uh, it has to be participatory. There should be policies involved. And of course, there has to be communication and the management has to be bottom up. So, so these types of governance models, uh, I think uh, Thailand gave us some sort of uh, evidence for this, but I think uh, most of the time uh, we don't have the examples to cite, and, and this is where uh, we felt that there has to be a lot of dialogue. Now with that, we'd we'll, like to go to the second question. Anis, please uh, show us the second question. So we wanted to see the, the policies and um, investments are needed to support the better integration of fisheries into rehabilitation and modernization of uh, irrigation. So here too, uh, what we felt was that uh, you know, we ask the question, so what are the policies that are there? So these policies obviously has to come from different countries. Do the fisheries departments and irrigation departments have conversations? And again, I think Thailand talked of having that kind of dialogue and looking at good practices. Um, I think there was another response that we got that said that there are administrative barriers for this conversation because the administration can be at different levels and therefore the management practices could be very different. So sometimes this communication does not happen. Um, in terms of policies, I think uh, we felt that there should be on pesticide control, uh, water quality standards, uh, there should be infrastructure, uh, capacity building was thought as very important, uh, looking at sort of landscape uh, situations, or environmental flows, and of course, uh, having more conversation because I think many felt that uh, there were no examples where this dialogue was taking place. So this I think uh, is a research need. And uh, this is something that we have to look forward to if we are to look at you know, fisheries and irrigation working side by side. Thank you, Matthew. Over to you. Thank 
you very much, Priyani. And uh, thank you very much to Mark and Sanjeev as well. Um, I think, yeah, very interesting. I wonder if anybody else wants to make any comments or to provide any um, feedback on what you've heard. So just if you uh, want to open up and, and just um, have any feedback at all, then please do so. It's got a, we've just got a couple of minutes to try and um, summarize what we've heard perhaps. I mean, for me, it was interesting. I think there's uh, very clearly the case that we need to develop more evidence around both the impacts of, of irrigation on fisheries, but also the benefits that the integrating fisheries into these schemes can bring. And I think as Mary Charlotte uh, indicated in the chat, um, the economic benefits need to obviously include all the, the co-benefits that, that arise from integrating fisheries. Um, so that we get a, to get the full picture, as it were, of otherwise there's potential for it, it to, to not fully reflect the totality of the situation and the benefits that fisheries bring. Um, anybody else got any, any, any final thoughts or, or comments? Can I add something? Sure. Yes, yes uh, good morning. Hi. Uh, I would just like to add that I think it's so important that we include an environmental thinking from the beginning. We cannot afford nowadays to not do so. Uh, we have to include uh, the, the, this thinking uh, from the very beginning when we're putting together the team, when we are giving information. We have to have that with us the whole time. Um, that we have no time to lose, and we cannot destroy any more rivers with too many, too much nutrients. And the same thing with with the agricultural land. We have to be very careful what we are doing. We have to have something to give to the next generation. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Very, very excellent point. And I think this whole this whole discussion around sustainability now, building resilience, of course, in the face of climate change. This is everything that uh, this Stockholm World Water Week is about. It's actually encapsulated, as it were, within this issue. And I think it's uh, incredibly important that we do that. And I noticed this ecosystem-based thinking um, was, was discussed a lot. And for me, that's also one thing that we need to really push uh, now and into the future, and including um, the donors and so on. Okay, with that, so thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much to all the, the to the breakout group leaders and uh, all your participation in this. I think we've, uh, it was, it sounds like, well, we had some very rich discussion and some very valuable insights into how to integrate fisheries uh, into irrigation systems. Um, we're now approaching the end of the session. I think we've only got about five minutes left. So I'd um, ask you to please join me in welcoming Mike Phillips, who's the direct, Director of Aquaculture and Fisheries Science at World Fish. Um, um, for the CGR program on fish agri-food, uh, actually on fish agri-food systems, or just into fish. And it was fish, that, that program, which in conjunction with another CGR research program on water, land and ecosystems, or WLE, which funded the development of the guidelines that you saw, which um, Sophie uh, presented. And so I'd just like to call on Mike, please, to uh, give his closing remarks to this, for the end of this session. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, everyone, for um, I think a very productive session. Uh, I guess some of the key points that 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 came through to, to me in listening to the presentations and one of the group sessions, there's there's clearly a, a need and an opportunity here to um, integrate uh, fisheries with uh, water, water management, water policy, across the whole cycle, from the design through to the implementation. And that, um, whilst there's a need to gather more evidence, um, we can see the indications of positive in outcomes if we do that in terms of food and nutrition, livelihoods and social benefits, as well as the environment and ecosystem uh, um, outcomes that are our last, one of our last, um, uh, participants uh, emphasize, but gathering uh, and, and really communicating well that, that evidence is important. It's clear also that this cross-sectoral uh, dialogue 
um, and cooperation needs to be developed, enhanced, and, and supported both, both across fishery and water sectors, um, and, but also at various, uh, various levels. And, and there's some positive recommendations from the discussion that um, I think help, help us move forward. But clearly, moving forward, continuing the dialogue um, is really, really, really important. And, and I, I wonder, you know, within this, this group, if there are some champions, some partners beyond IMI and World Fish, such as ICID and Quinchainat, others in the group here that really can help move this whole dialogue towards imp practical implement implementation, gather evidence, put the ideas into, uh, in, 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 into practice. So you know, please do, do step forward. You know, from this uh, from this session, and um, uh, let's let's look towards strengthening the dialogue and 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 the partnership. So, with that, I'd, I'd say a big thank you to the um, the organisers, um, the presenters, and to all all the participants. Um, CGR, uh, Willfish. Um, Imi and our partners within the CGR are all committed to move forward with uh, many of the ideas that have been you know, discussed to see this stronger integration of water and fish within a food system, within a water system, uh, uh, you know, uh, approach. So with that, thank you. Um, let the dialogue continue from the strong and interesting platform today. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'm happy to close the session. And here's the next session as well, just put up by uh, Annie. So rice and fish systems, again, fish reaching out across the agriculture and water sectors just to see the strong integration we all need in our food system for the future. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Stay safe and healthy. Bye for now.